welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Dave Rogers and Suan Pacheco. How are you, Suan? Hi, David. How are you? Fantastic. And today we're onwards with our discourse about Jordan Peterson's 12 yes. Rules for Life. Yes. And today we're going to be delving into rule number nine, which is assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. So do you want to start off with a feedback to that chapter topic? Or do you, I think, I know you have a quote also from the chapter. Yet when you hear that, what, what comes to mind? So what comes to mind is to be humble. Be humble uh, to the information that is around you and, and the people that are around you. So rather than walking around with a sense of that you know everything, Every person that comes into your life is in your life to help you learn and grow. Oftentimes we don't see that, right? Because we always think, you know, I already know this or I can do this myself. And I'm guilty of that sometimes. And, um, but it's just getting you to step back. Think about, you know, why am I interacting with this individual? Why is this individual bothering me in the way that they're bothering me? And so when you take a moment to, to really be humble and really listen to what that other person has to say, it's often from their perspective and their experiences. And how does that reflect with what you're going through? And sometimes it's just a matter of just, hey, you know, just taking in what you're taking in and see where that might lead you or not lead you. Uh, when I read this chapter, and thank you for sharing, first of all, so and, and again, that's that's the beauty of asking a question without uh, having a attachment to the outcome. And so when I ask you what was your learning from that, and then can listen, I'm going to be getting a, a greater appreciation of, of your perspective. And uh, this one made me smile because not only did this book uh, come from my son, because he actually ordered this book and it got delivered to my place. And then I, I reread it. And so this chapter was and represents my philosophy in parenting. And I've just found the experience of being a parent and particularly listening to my son has often led to perspectives that are just totally different from my perspective. It's like 180 degrees or, or just the opposite. And it's just been such a bewildering experience being a parent, yet really putting into practice, assume the person you're listening to might know something. And isn't that cool from a perspective that our kids can teach us so much? Yes, because I'm a parent as well. And I often find myself in conversations with both of my children. And I sit there and I don't know if my mouth is like open or not when I'm listening to them. But it's, it's, I'm, I'm just in awe with some of the information that they shared and the perspective of what they have gained in the time that they have been with us and in the short lifespan that they've had so far and the maturity that they have this perspective. And I just, I'm, I'm always in awe of that. And I think it's also refreshing and beautiful. I didn't have that when I was growing up with my parents because oftentimes it's like, you know, children are to be seen but not heard. So to have those conversations with my parents really didn't happen. And so because I am encouraging those conversations with mine, I see them in a different light and I appreciate them in a different light. And it just gives me a reassurance that everything that I have worked with them to help them to grow, it's reassuring. And it's, the messaging hasn't gotten lost. However, to hear their perspective also teaches me that some of my parenting styles isn't for everybody. And I may have to change things and also learn from them as to how to adjust to better understand where they're coming from. 
which comes back to your original word that this chapter really meant uh, about humility. And so when one is humble, they can tend to listen to things as opposed to attachment to be right or wrong in a situation. And quite often parents are, are in a situation where they're stressed out and, and they have to be right about everything because they're so urgent and has to be done yesterday. And so there's that sense of, of battling that does go on in many households. And I, I did smile as I, the first chapter in this, the first paragraph in this chapter Chapter nine, this is rule number nine again, and just repeat it. Assume the person you are listening to might know something. And then Jordan goes into psychotherapy. It's a conversation and everybody can benefit from it. And it's been a really fun experience because in the last two years, or the last two, uh, uh, actually the last six months, I've engaged uh, a couple of therapists, psychotherapists, and have been uh, involved in conversations that really are about triggering old records or old trauma so that if it gets triggered with breathing or with awareness or with a therapist, we can look at it differently and perhaps give it a new spin and then have something that might've been a experience that pulled me down. It can actually lighten me up and bring some laughter into the situation, yet uh, a, a seriousness that to really discover oneself uh, it is a day-to-day -day journey because something that doesn't trigger us today might trigger us next month. And that's the humility again component that comes into play. I understand you have a quote from this chapter. Uh, would you like yes. to read your quote and we can discuss that a little bit? Yes, the quote that is, just give me one second here. The quote is on page 250 and it says, it takes a village to organize a mind. So that's, that stopped me as I was reading it. And I had paused to think about it. And for me, you know, we all have heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And so when you say organize a mind, to me, it was like, so are you saying it takes a village to brainwash somebody to think like them? And so it's, for me, it was a bit controversial in the sense that, yes, it takes, a, if it takes, if we believe that it takes a village to raise a child, meaning neighbor A, B, and C is looking out for wherever your child is in the neighborhood. Are you saying that they also have to think like you? Because if they have to think like you, that does not make them an individual pursuing their life path journey. And so when I read this, again, I, I thank you so much for picking out the quote and, and even discussing this. Uh, I went to a slightly different direction. It was more of, it takes a village to raise a child, yet in this chapter, it was really what I took away was the types of conversations that one has to develop to be able to develop their own confidence, their own ability to navigate and so it's not about having all neighbors that are wonderful and beautiful no sometimes it's the grumpy old neighbor or the neighbor who who throws feces at you that <laughs> actually teaches you some of the lessons that might uh, provide you with the skills to have a conversation to to step up and stand for right so it's this complexity of conversations or abundance of conversations that in many ways uh, the sadness of perhaps this past year for some people is they haven't had the opportunity to have discourse they haven't had the opportunity to have arguments and discussions and and maybe even debates and however the, yes however if you are born with an innate intelligence and have a sense of um you know left hand right hand what is he trying to say organize a mind because when you are put into the school system you're 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 being trained to think in a universal way that is accepted by society so standing out is oftentimes frowned upon so is this his way of saying that he subscribes to the way that we train our children via the school system and our universal beliefs in terms of parenting? Is that what he's, he's connotating in that phrase? 
I absolutely do not think that is what he's implying. I'm actually the organization of the mind. I believe he's looking at is the sophistication of the mind, the practicing of the mind, the feedback of the mind. I actually, given what the way Jordan has taught his classes at U of T, there seems to be he is engaging in conversation dialogue. He wants people to disagree with him. That's part of the organization. That's part of the 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 nail. There's an expression in Australia that's quite popular. It's tall poppy syndrome, where the one who stands up gets slashed. Or in Japan, it's also uh, the nail that sticks up gets slammed. In many ways, I feel that Peterson suggesting that. For you to organize your way of seeing, experiencing, feeling the world, it's not necessarily been nurtured through our academic system, which traditionally has been to train robots so they can work on the assembly line. And he wants people to challenge him. He wants people to have debate. Uh, at least that's how I read the chapter, because the key component was to really encourage conversation. And again, the fact that you're taking that one part of the chapter and then perhaps having your way of, of perhaps questioning it and querying it is great. That's why we're having this conversation today. Mine was about having a robust environment where you can have various conversations where perhaps you need to be a little bit like a chameleon and change your spots a little bit so that the connection, the communication perhaps the agreement can be done or not, because the decision not to do something sometimes is important as the decision to do something. Okay, but in a village setting, if you have been guided and trained to think in a certain way, and not to step outside the bounds of that village, and are within a belief system that this is just how the, the cycle of life happens, and you have been given no incentive to go that one step further, as you've said, to explore what else is there, then in a sense, you have cocooned that individual into thinking this is just what life is in terms of that little bubble. And that's where I feel the danger is with a statement like that. When you say organize a mind, it's you're telling somebody, you're not, I didn't get from that line that you are free to go and explore what is beneficial for you. For me, what I got from that was, are you saying that someone is going to tell me what to believe without giving me the opportunity to learn what to believe? And I guess that's where you, you're, 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 you're focused on that one statement that's beautiful. Mine is, as we have a village with a, a really wise team of leaders who are going to provide you with some organization yet if you're going to be the future leader they're also equipping you with the skills to grow beyond what the current village is to be able to engage with the challenges of the next generation and that's one of the things we come back to our original parenting idea for us to instill our parents approach to parenting will take some of the best elements yet part of it's also to equip the next generation with the conversation skills, with the organization skills, with the creative skills, with the innovative skills to allow them to grow into the next generation. But if that previous generation is broken and they aren't equipped with the skills, how do you then help that young person who's impressionable to, to come to some sort of self-understanding that there is something more for them in the wider world. And that's where I believe that the idea of it takes a village because that village gives the individual an opportunity to see what resonates and mm -hmm. what doesn't resonate and then has the confidence and the self-esteem to move forward, maybe even against the wishes of the elders of the village. That's perhaps one of the definitions of progress. Mm. And so do you feel that um, with the guidance of elders, how much of it is them imposing their experience and their fears 
so that that young individual takes that learning and adapts it to their way of learning. And that's, that is part of the evolution that the societies that have the way that it's influenced dramatically through fear will continue to go through cycles of fear where the others will notice the fear yet will also perhaps counterbalance it with the excitement. And there's a dynamic balance. And I guess you're, you're triggering my reminder of Buddha when he went on his journey of seven years to experience suffering in all different ways. And he went against the parents, yet he did that because there was an inner knowingness. And I believe that when you have a beautiful tribe of, of elders that can even have this type of conversation where there is a little bit of banter, there is a little back and forth. And then they also maybe even make the, the instruction to the juniors, yet the juniors will sometimes say, yeah, nah, we know the young ones today, whatever. And so there's that way that that's the conversation that we could get our, ourselves all upset or, or angry that we don't have the type of conversation that exactly what we would like. Yet there's that, again, that nuance, that uh, conversation that might happen in a different way than what we anticipate or possibly expect. But then that goes back to the point you just made there about Buddha having an inner knowing. So if that person has that inner knowing, just what exactly are we saying when we say, you know, it takes a village to organize a mind? If you already have that inner knowing, is what he's saying that it takes the village to help that individual understand that inner knowing as opposed to suppressing that inner knowing? What do you feel that Peterson is saying when he makes a statement like that? The opportunity to have engaging, perhaps confrontational, challenging experiences and challenges may be the resistance or pressure that creates the perturbation that the person has the confidence to break through perhaps a structure or organization that may have served in the past and be part of the evolution and growth of themselves and the society mm -hmm. And so do you feel that because he, because he's used his life work to study and understand the mind, is that also part of the mystery of the mind? Do you feel by him making that sort of a statement? Yes, I believe that there's, there's a process and there's a progress and each individual is unique and that's part of the challenge when we're talking about huge organizations is it is set up to manage the mean or the 80 percentile or the 90 percentile so it's quite often the leaders of the next generation are going to be the outliers they're going to be in this organization yet they're going to have perhaps a time when they have that breakthrough moment or that perturbation or that stepping into self that might go against the old organization and look to perhaps be either part of the change or perhaps even go, might go and go on a personal journey for a while and they may or may not come back or okay i'll give you that but maybe it's the counter maybe he is saying that with a village and organizing the mind. If you are reinforcing positive things, reinforcing encouragement, reinforcing self-esteem, reinforcing that yes, it's okay to make mistakes. Yes, it's okay to fail at things. That, that in fact is what will help that individual become a full self, loving person will encourage them to love themselves as they are do you feel that's what he may be suggesting with that particular phrase mm, given my reading of the chapter and my mm, 
curiosity with Jordan Peterson, I wouldn't feel that he would put it in that way. Okay. Um, his is a lot of what he's teaching is not necessarily about loving yourself. It's more about exploring yourself, growing yourself, challenging yourself, as opposed to sitting there perhaps in the hey, wah, I love myself, I love myself. And so that's- But isn't uh, that ultimately what it comes down to when you do that sort of self-exploration? Um, not necessarily. Uh, mm. I, I, um, I don't feel that the goal is to get to a point where um, you're simply in a lotus position and mantra <laughs> that I love myself. It's, it's uh, about being present and in circumstances to be able to draw on uh, experiences to be present and to um, express compassion, express love, express curiosity in the situation. And Buddha would question, he would, he, again, his whole journey, at least what I've read so far, and I continue to be very curious about this, is that no matter where you're going to go, whatever you have attachments to, you'll experience suffering. And um, I'm going to bring this back to just at the quote of the rule and then get your last feedback as we bring this little session to a close. Thank you so very much. Rule nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Well, in closing, I would say in listening to what you've shared with me today, uh, Dave, I've learned something from you as well. And so it just comes back to what I said originally. It's taking a moment to pause, reflect on what has been shared and see how that information that you've heard, first ask yourself if, if you have heard it in the way that it was intended from the, in, the individual that you're um, having that conversation with. And once you get that clarity, in what way can it apply if you choose to apply it to the circumstances? And, um, and if not, how do you see that individual? In what ways do you see that individual that is um, beneficial? And I'm gonna pick up a word that you said, and it was awe that when you have conversations with your young ones, you're often in awe. And I'm going to just pick off that a little bit and build on inviting people who might be seeing this today is to infuse perhaps some awe-inspiring moments in your conversations. Awesome experiences in your conversations. And invite some awe into conversations that you might have. And while you have your awe in process, take a deep breath and allow that to be the interrupt that allows you to listen with more than your ears, perhaps with your heart, and perhaps with a whole new respect to the people you have conversations with. With that, thank you very much, Suan. You have a great session and day ahead. And this is the end of rule number nine from, Les uh, from Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Thank you very Thanks, much. Dave.